Yeah. I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And something that we are taught growing up is don't judge other people. Don't be so judgy. Don't be judgmental, right? As humans, we just accept people for who they are and move on and try to get along and be nice. That is, until you get a notice from your local courthouse saying you are going to be a juror. And then that's your job. Your job is to judge other people, judge their credibility, judge their motives, judge their actions, and ultimately decide a case. Today, that job got even more difficult for the jury in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's the Theodore Edgecombe case. He's accused of murder. He's claiming self-defense. And as many self-defense defendants do, he took the stand to tell his story. So now it's up, this, up to this jury to, to, to listen to the testimony, figure out, is this guy telling the truth? Is he telling us what really happened? Is he telling us what he was really thinking? Is he telling us why he did everything? Or is he lying to us? Is he trying to pull the wool over our eyes? This is a tough job. A really tough job for jurors because there aren't many facts that are in dispute. There's a little fact here, a little fact there. It, it's really about how he felt and, and why he shot and killed Jason Clearman. Yeah, there's some other facts involved here that they'll have to decide if he's being truthful about. But ultimately, listening to someone talk and trying to figure out why exactly he shot and killed this man. It's a tough job. It's an important job. And we've seen it here in court TV. So many defendants now taking the witness stand. Kyle Rittenhouse did the same thing in the same state. Jury found his story to be very reasonable, found him not guilty. Let's take a look at the direct examination of Theodore Edgecombe. So I brace for impact. As I brace for impact, um, the vehicle just clips me, hits my pedal, hits my leg, and then also hits the handlebar, knocks me onto a parked car. You can say what he said, Mr. Edgecombe. Damn, you can't drive, get the out of the road. Came up to the passenger window and just asked him, hey, you know, where you guys talking to me? And. He said, yes, and I punched him. These individuals were chasing me down. They were trying to hit me. I knew this deliberately now at this point. Um, I became, fear, you know, came over me, you know, as I heard that. Um, Amal Arbery resonated in my mind because I'm like, these people are hunting me down now at this point. The reason I got on the curb is because they, I seen them heading towards me. And I'm thinking if I get on the sidewalk, they'll at least tear up their vehicle before they hit me. So that was my reasoning as to, you know, jumping on the sidewalk in that instant because they were headed directly towards me. They were, they were so close, in fact, that I could feel the heat of the engine on my backside. This gentleman actually took uh, one large step and lunged toward me like he was going to tackle me. And I took a step back, and as I stepped back, it was a, the reaction from that, the firearm just went off. And with him lunging towards me, I didn't know if he was going after the firearm, if he was coming after me or what, but I know from his words and his actions, his boisterous tone, he told me, I'm going to kill you now. Is it just me, or did that sound a lot like the testimony of Kyle Rittenhouse? Almost like a script. He lunged for my gun. He said, I'm going to kill you. All those things. It's, it's interesting. It's, it's fascinating. Now, his version of, of what happened that night, he did nothing wrong. He initiated nothing. They hit him with their car. And after they hit him with the car, they threw racial slurs at him. 
Then when they're at the red light, he approaches and says, did you say anything to me? And then they hit him again with the racial slurs. So then he does admit punching him and then, again, riding away in his bike and then being chased, and then you heard the rest of it. Um, this, is, this is ultimately what this case is about. Is this jury going to find this reasonable? Is this a reasonable explanation for what happened? Wow. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Joy Lim Nakran joining us live tonight from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. What a day inside the courtroom with the defendant on the witness stand. Um, we showed some of the big moments from direct examination. Tell us about cross-examination because I always say you can't judge any witness until they've been crossed. Absolutely, Vinny. And, you know, I think what was most telling was just the reaction of the jurors. During direct examination, it seemed like a couple of jurors were, were quite sympathetic to this defendant. In particular, I noticed a, a, a black female juror who seemed to be in her 30s, who was leaning forward during direct examination, really soaking in what he was saying, especially when he kind of laid out the context of the year 2020 and the aftermath of George Floyd's killing and kind of increased tensions that may have led to uh, reasonable fear on his part. I also noticed uh, the only black male on the juror uh, also appearing very engaged during direct examination. But that all changed during cross-examination. Those jurors who seemed to be very sympathetic suddenly turned skeptical. Let's go ahead and play a clip of cross-examination during which uh, the prosecutor really questions Edgecombe hard on uh, kind of his account of what happened that night. Let's listen. They're ahead of you. You can't let them get away. You're infuriated. You bike after them, correct? To catch up with them. Armed with a gun, right? Are you asking the question, yeah. are you? Yeah, armed with a gun, right? You've got a gun. Yes, at okay. this point. You fled from the scene, correct? From... Homicide scene. You fled from the scene, isn't that correct? So yes or no, sir? I, I was only able to you, um, get away from there, do it. So you, you fled from that area, isn't that correct? Yes, I did leave from and then, that scene. Thank you. And then you fled from the state. Isn't that correct? Are you? Yes. And I, then you ditched the weapon that would have linked you to that shooting. Isn't that correct? Yes, I'm asking. Overruled. You can answer it. Can you repeat that? You ditched the weapon that would have linked you to that shooting. Isn't that correct? I didn't want to be... Sir, you ditched the weapon that would have linked you to the shooting. Yes or no? Can you, ex like, expound on ditch? No. Vinny, uh, you can see that the, the defendant is really being, I guess, what many would call evasive. On several occasions, he didn't answer questions, and the judge uh, at several points actually just told the defendant, you need to answer the questions that are being asked to you. And, and during that kind of uh, testimony, that's when jurors who initially look sympathetic look kind of irritated with this defendant, quite honestly. Unbelievable cross-examination. Um, classic cross-examination. Don't always see it from prosecutors because they don't get that many opportunities. Um, but it, it, it was effective. Now, let's talk about the last witness. It was a witness, you know, I started talking about Kyle Rittenhouse and his case, same state, same defense, self-defense. Um, they had one of the same witnesses. That's right. And it, it's a very critical witness to Kyle Rittenhouse's defense and successful acquittal, ultimately. That's use of force expert John Black, who some of our viewers might recognize. So, you know, this is a really interesting. Uh, frankly, the, the, the scope of his testimony was extremely limited. Uh, you know, he was talking about biases surrounding these sorts of incidents. But the reason this was really key is that 
the defense, not just in, in the course of this trial, but kind of in, in public discourse and uh, some of the rallies leading up to the trial, they've raised this question of whether a black defendant can be successful in using the same defense as Kyle Rittenhouse, even with a white alleged victim here. And here you have the defense calling the same uh, expert witness that was critical to Kyle Rittenhouse's acquittal. And also, I think it is worth noting that by, by Ivory Lamar, uh, the defense attorney, one of the defense attorneys for this defendant, also represented Jacob Blake's family as well, Vinny. Joy Limnakran in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the middle of it all today. Thank you so much. Let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, former federal prosecutor and law professor at Texas Southern University, Michael Sterling, is with us. In Seattle, Washington, trial attorney Ann Bremner. And in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Albert Wunsch III. Great to see everyone tonight. Michael right. Sterling, um, your thoughts. I know you don't like putting defendants on the stand, correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. I think most criminal defense attorneys don't like putting their clients on the stand. Well, television anchors no, love it. Like it. Television anchors love it, okay? We love it, but... What are your thoughts about his testimony today? Because he basically said that they were the aggressors verbally. They hit him with the car. Then they're then um, he, he's throwing racial slurs at him. Then when he comes up to say, "Are you are you talking to me?" Um, again with the racial slurs. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know he did what he could do in terms of explaining the circumstances and situation that. You know, he admits that he was infuriated when he heard the racial slur that he went to, that he approached the vehicle, that he punched the individual uh, because he was infuriated and that, you know, he wished he would have done things differently that night. And then I think subsequent to that, he explains exactly what happened when the encounter occurred and the gunshot went off uh, and then talked about, you know, on direct examination, uh, you know, uh, why he sort of fled the, the scene and ultimately the jurisdiction. I, you know, I thought it was, you know, I thought it was an explanation in terms of what happened. And I thought the prosecutors were really tough on cross-examination. Uh, and you just have to see how it comes out in the watch, what the jurors actually believe and what they find credible. Uh, but I, but I, I thought he was, I thought he was, I found him to be, you know, fairly credible, Benny, in terms of admitting that, you know, he was wrong for running up and punching. He probably could have, you know, went the other way and he wished he had done things differently. And Bremner, what do you think jurors are going to remember more, the director or the cross? Oh, the cross. Oh, I mean, that was amazing, cross. And you're right, Benny. Prosecutors aren't that great at cross-examination of witnesses, especially defendants. And it was, it was like, it, it was almost like the cross-examination of Dennis Fung. Remember in the O.J. Simpson trial? What about this? What about that, Mr. Fung? Just you know, staccato and and basically getting short answers from the defendant and cornering him to where he he has to basically hedge and be evasive. And that's when the jurors turn. So I think they're going to remember the cross. Al, the part that I'm confused about tonight now after this testimony is it seems the gun accidentally went off. Yes. The gun. So, so, that, so is it still self-defense if the gun accidentally goes off? I, I, it, not and, at and all. It, what is it? It's, in this case, murder. But in most instances, if the gun goes off accidentally, it's, it's involuntary manslaughter or voluntary manslaughter, one or the other, um, it's not murder and it's not self-defense. And that was what surprised me about his testimony, was that he brought up another defense that had never been brought up before, was that it went off accidentally. I mean, there's so many problems with this guy's story. So many problems. I mean, first of all, the, the attorney, Clearman, is a immigration attorney. I, you know, I've done a fair amount of immigration. OK, you're generally not dealing with white people in the immigration business. So I cannot imagine that he was a racist with regards to the, the comments that were made and that kind of stuff. I mean, this guy had a script and that's why the self that the cross examination was perfect, because that made him deviate from his script. He had all the right catchphrases. He had all the right, uh, you know, panoply of excuses with regards to what was going on here. That then when all of a sudden the script ended and he had to ad lib, it was a disaster. So, I mean, kudos to the attorneys that, that prepped him. 
they prepped them good, but those attorneys did not prep them on a cross examination. And and I don't, you know, this was a decent exact cross examination, but honestly, Vin, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. Okay, this was the like it was a softball because this guy was just horrible on the stand. All and right. you know, and I, the jury's got to make the determination now. And and again, they don't have to believe him beyond a reasonable doubt. They just have to believe that his version is reasonable.